Good morning, Ted. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you for letting me visit you in your home here in Ames, Iowa. You're welcome. I am speaking with Frank Tedesco, Jr., known as Ted Tedesco in the city of Ames. That's right. Ted, do I have <laughs> your permission to videotape you and chat with you today? Yes. Thank you. Tell me when and where you were born. Um, August 29th, 1936 in Council Bluffs, Iowa. And what did your father do? What was your reason for being in Council Bluffs? Uh, my father was an oral surgeon and um, he was born and raised there also, as well as my mother. And so I was there too. <laughs> did you have an interest in science then? Um, not really. <laughs> Um, I did watch my father many times because it was a railroad town. He did have a lot of clients that were railroad people and he would schedule appointments in the evening or even like 10 o'clock at night to fit their schedule. And I'd go to the office with him and kind of watch and I never did like all the blood and guts, I guess. So I just remember he always said, do something that you're happy with and enjoy doing. Sounds like good advice. <laughs> How did you get to Ames, Iowa then? Well, I graduated from Abraham Lincoln High School in 1954 and uh, came to Iowa State College in those days. So I came in the fall of 1954. What was your major? Um, it was dairy husbandry because that was gonna be a precursor for me to go to vet school. Uh, but in those days, they only took about 20 students each year in vet school. And I enjoyed a lot of extracurricular activities and didn't have straight A's and stuff, so I didn't go to vet school. Plus, I had uh, uh, some back surgery that was going to uh, forego my uh, heavy lifting and particularly dealing with larger animals because I would have dealt with farm animals probably. And so uh, then I did a little investigation, went into the insurance business. Tell me what it was like to be a student at Iowa State from 1954 to 1958. Well, of course, it was a much smaller venue. And of course, the other thing that was um, difficult was that there were about five or six boys to every girl on campus. <laughs> so uh, uh, you had to work to get a date because there were a lot of opportunities for the girls. <laughs> um, I think it was um, because it was smaller, it was a little more quaint. Um, we called campus town dog town. Mm -hmm. uh, it was much more vibrant with more variety than it has today. Certainly there were no bars. Mm -hmm. um, the only bars were downtown on Main Street. And uh, so there were clothing stores. There was a tobacco shop on the corner, Welsh and Lincoln Way. Mm -hmm. There were restaurants. Uh, there were uh, the bookstores, student supply, et cetera, and the two movie houses were there at that time too. So, uh, and it did not go as far south as it goes today. Mm -hmm. uh, it really didn't go past uh, Chamberlain if you were going up mm -hmm. Welsh. It was just mm -hmm. the two blocks on uh, Lincoln Way, uh, either side of Welsh, about a block and a half each way. I think it's interesting that there were no bars. Apparently there was a different attitude towards alcohol. Oh, absolutely. Um, there was a dean on campus by the name of Dean Helzer, um, who was very strict. And uh, if you were caught drinking, you were gone. He'd even call your mother. If you got, I think, five parking tickets, you were gone. There was very strict rules. But you could go downtown, and there are some of the bars on Main Street today to the east end, the sportsmen, uh, are still there and were were uh, hangouts, and it was much stricter about enforcing the 21 drinking age too. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have a lot of uh, false IDs, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. We were very much aware. And uh, there were celebrations, however, over in the housing unit where the old WOI TV studios are, and uh, I don't know, microbiology is over in that area now, but that used to be a trailer court. And uh, a lot of students lived in those trailers, particularly married students. But when somebody would turn 21, 
there were always big parties over there. So, <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever go to one of them? Oh, I guess I was at one or two or three or four, <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, let's come back to the idea of insurance for just a second, okay. because that's how you made your living um, here in Ames. Right. Um, your dad was an oral surgeon. You were looking at dairy husbandry. How did and you knew that you needed something that was not going to require heavy lifting. So how did you make the shift to insurance? Well, uh, a friend and I had purchased a uh, Model A, 1929 Model A, and we I knew we need to have insurance. So I had uh, went downtown, and the McDowell agency was at Main Street, 319 Main Street. And I went in and uh, purchased auto insurance. I uh, later purchased additional insurance because his friend and I worked on a dairy farm sale and we bought a cap that we showed and hauled around in the car. It was an old, old, uh, I think it was a, later we traded it and we got an old Plymouth, a four door Plymouth, and we could take the seat out of the back and we put a bale of hay in there and some straw and we would take this heifer calf to shows and put her in the back seat and off we'd go. And so uh, I knew those people, so um, I went down to visit with them about was there an opportunity for employment. So that was my first contact. This might have been 1957, 58, somewhere this around then? Yeah, okay. yeah, 1958, spring of 58, right. And so they, uh, they said, well, they were willing to uh, have me go to Des Moines to the Travelers Insurance Company and uh, take a test to see if I was really cut out to be an insurance person agent. And I did. And it was a psychological test, I'm sure, that was talked about whether you were an extrovert or introvert and uh, how uh, you looked at things. And apparently I passed. <laughs> <laughs> Are you willing to tell me what? You, what your starting pay was? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, I went to work for the McDowell Agency, and the principal at that time was Mr. Bill Vogt. It was McDowell Insurance and Real Estate, and Bill was actually head of the real estate. Uh, Mr. McDowell, although McDowell, the founder, had retired at that point. And uh, I got $291 a month. <laughs> and... Compared to what other people were making at that time, how did that compare, other college oh, graduates? Well, one of the reasons that they offered me that was because Joni, my wife, was working too. They thought that was plenty of income for us. We <laughs> didn't have any children, lived in an apartment. And um, so I would guess that at that point it was probably about, oh, 25 to 30% of what others were making in the agency, but I was willing to do it, mm -hmm. you know. When you first start out in insurance in Ames, you'd gone to college here, so you knew the town a little bit. Good. How do you get going? Well, of course, uh, you were pretty isolated into the college community, the mm -hmm. stu student population. So I was being introduced into the business side of the town. And so we started a program where I would send out about 10 letters a week with a penny attached. That was a penny for your time to read this letter. And then I would follow it up with a phone call. And if I got an interview, uh, the Travelers Insurance Company at that time put out a little notepad that would fit in your pocket with a nice leather cover. And I would give you one of those and we would start talking about insurance. Nowadays, we kind of call that a cold call. You just had to start fresh out and see people and see people and see people. That was the motto, see people, see people, see people. But it gave me the opportunity uh, to learn and get to, to know about every business person within the community, um, some of their employees and actually the people at the top. So it was a wonderful learning experience. I also dealt with some of the higher echelon at Iowa State. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, the president, vice presidents, and uh, heads of departments, and prominent professors. Let's talk about those people that you got to know on Main Street. Because okay. many people who are interested in the oral history of Ames are interested in what businesses were located where, <laughs> and what were those people like <laughs> who, who managed them and um, ran them. So, 
first of all, describe, uh, we're, we're talking in 2011, and right now, say what business is on the spot at 319 where you first started working. Well, of course, today it's um, Swank Jewelry. Okay. Actually, that building was very narrow frontage, was divided in half. Uh, we were in the east side, mm -hmm. and then the west side was Wilcox Laundry. And when Fred Swank bought the building, then why well, McDowell's moved over on Fifth Street where the um, uh, Moore Dairy was. Mm -hmm. And when Fred Swank built that building, then Mr. Wilcox had passed away, and, and mm -hmm. he took the whole building, and that's what you walk into now as Swank Jewelry. Mm -hmm. What was it like to have a, will, a laundry next door? Was it kind of noisy? No, really it wasn't too bad. Um, uh, we each had our own separate doorway because they didn't have air conditioning. And of course, all the steam and heat from doing the laundry, they always had their back and front doors open. Uh, we were much more comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're dealing here like the, the mid to late 1950s. Take me then on that north side of Main Street, just your block there, other okay. businesses. If you would start at the west end of that block, there was a vacant lot which housed the uh, farm equipment and trailers for Montgomery Ward. And then Montgomery Ward is, uh, was actually where about Fasco is today. Mm -hmm. And then you came up and it was Yonkers store. Mm -hmm. uh, then you had Wilcox, McDowell's, uh, you had brown shoe fit in where um, the cooking uh, emporium mm -hmm. uh, is today. Uh, then you had another small jewelry store. Then, of course, was the hotel. Mm -hmm. And it had the barber shop where it is today in the hotel. And the hotel was very prominent. Then right on the corner then was actually uh, a clothing store. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that was actually called Ober's. Excuse me, Ober's was in the next block. I'm wrong. That was House of Vision for glasses. Yes. Okay. <laughs> then if you go across to, uh, Kellogg, uh, on farther to the east, why uh, you had, uh, of course, Tilden's was in that block, mm -hmm. and you didn't have the American Legion in there mm -hmm. at all. Um, you later had Rogers China, which mm -hmm. was the China from Cars Hardware across the street. Uh, Dick Rogers moved over there with that, and that mm -hmm. became a very prominent shot. Yes. yes. Well, let's talk a little bit about Sheldon Munn Hotel. What was it like at that time? Well, Sheldon Munn was a very uh, elaborate uh, hotel. Uh, of course, it had the main lobby, much like it is today. And if you went to that counter and then went to the left, there was a ballroom. If you went to the right where Firehouse Books is today was a restaurant mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then there were nice rooms. Everybody who came to Ames and stayed um, would stay at the Sheldon Lund. And in fact, uh, we used to, as a business community, a lot of times go about 7.30 uh, to that cafe and have coffee and just mm -hmm. talk, kind of plan our day. But people would be there like... Uh, Jack Benny was there. Really? Uh, so we talked to Jack Benny. And then, of course, about once every, um, oh, six weeks to two months, the DOT, which was the Iowa Highway Commission at those times, uh, would hold their uh, lettings for highway oh. projects. So all of the big contractors would come in dames a day or two before mm -hmm. uh, finishing up their bids and be there in the morning and then go down to, to the DOT's offices and uh, see what jobs they got or didn't get. Mm -hmm. I think they probably talked about who should get this job and who should get that job. <laughs> but, but it all worked out. It worked out And of course, perfect. in the 60s, in later 60s, there were a lot of contractors because as you know, at that point we were starting the uh, interstate I-35 on the east side of Ames. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of preparatory work big grading work contracts, uh, big culvert contracts, bridge mm -hmm. contracts, yep. So um, also at the Sheldon Munn, um, was, it, was there sort of a coffee clutch? Was this kind of, that's, you said the business people would come in 7.15, 7.30, you met regularly then? Right, there was also another place across the street from uh, the McDowell Agency at 319 was Woolworks. 
And in those days, of course, Woolworths had a counter, a food counter. A lot mm -hmm. of the business people ate lunch there. There are the Elks Club. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them would meet and have coffee there. It wasn't as conducive to talk to everybody because at the hotel you had booths or tables that you'd be around mm -hmm. instead of just the stools around the counter. counter. Yeah. Yep. Um, but still, a lot of opportunities for you as a young business person to get to know other people downtown. I mean, it was kind of your networking. Yes. And, and of course, uh, uh, the JC organization mm -hmm. um, was a great one because that was all the young men at that mm -hmm. time. There were the JCs and then the JCs, which were had to be wives of the JCs. And it was between 21 and 35. So there were a few that owned their own businesses, uh, like a barber or something. And, but a lot of the assistant managers, those people coming up that would later be business managers mm -hmm. and owners, uh, you had to leave that organization when you turned 35. We were called exhausted roosters. Well, we still are <laughs> until you die, I guess. But actually, um, w the JCs just celebrated in 2011 their 80th anniversary. Um, I was about the 40th president, so I was right in the middle, but mm -hmm. was invited back. But the JCs actually started the Chamber of Commerce in Ames because mm -hmm. there were people who became exhausted but still wanted to have an organization. Exactly. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the JCs because it was, in a sense, um, a collegial group. I mean, it was partly social, but you did lots of good things um, for the community. Let's take um, things for kids. You did some things for kids. Oh, we did lots of things uh, for kids. Uh, we did the Easter egg hunts mm -hmm. all the time. We also did the sandbox project um, where we would take sand out mm -hmm. and for a dollar we'd fill their sandbox. Mm -hmm. uh, we later uh, expanded that project because we got uh, Mr. Bill Waters down at Waters Firestone, which is now Trickle Firestone, mm -hmm. or not Firestone, Trickle's Tire Repair or whatever. And, mm -hmm. uh, for a dollar, uh, we could sell the old tractor tires, and we'd take them out to the yard and fill them with sand. Mm -hmm. And so we did those kinds of things. And then, then we worked uh, with kids. We, the JCs were actually the ones that purchased for one dollar from the city of Ames the fire truck that's still in Brookside Park, and we raised money and had it put on permanent pedestals, and. Uh, uh, it's there for the kids to play on today. And what, can you tell me about when that happened? Can you think about I that? I was trying to think about that the other day, but it had to be in the late 60s. Okay. Uh, the department was just starting to get some updated uh -huh. equipment. Yeah. Um, also, I think that the JCs had a circus here in town. <laughs> oh, yes. We did a <laughs> lot of projects. <laughs> uh, but one year we uh, contracted with the Clyde Beatty Circus uh, to come to Ames. And, uh, you know, Monday nights used to be the big night on Main Street. And mm -hmm. the stores were all open till 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock. And there were a lot of people downtown. And at that time, uh, Oslin Drugstore, which is actually where Bout and Nova's offices are today, uh, moved farther down west into the next block of Main Street, mm -hmm. and that building was open. Now, can Our, you give me a general time frame here? Um, this would have been uh, early probably 1960s? in the early 70s. Oh, early 70s, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. And Art had been a former JC, and, mm -hmm. and so the building was empty, so he said we could use it, and the circus brought in a monkey, a chimpanzee, and a baby elephant. And so we would hawk the people out on the street, had signs, some were clown outfits, and get the little kids in there and sell those people tickets mm -hmm. for the circus. Well, I suppose this isn't what you want to hear on tape, <laughs> but people don't understand how much elephants pee. <laughs> and it went through the floor. The place really stunk. I thought we were gonna to have to end up buying a building, but graciously, we didn't have to. Um, later on, the circus came to town mm -hmm. the night or the day before they performed in Marshalltown. Mm -hmm. And uh, the place we were having them was down uh, in the place where Lincoln Center is today. That used to be an open field. Then there was the high school football field that mm -hmm. was up on the east side. And the old roundhouse sat up mm -hmm. close to Lincoln Way. 
Well, the night that they were coming over, it started pouring rain, and it poured and it poured, and they got here probably close to midnight. And another fellow and I met them on South 4th Street, and so they started to pull in, and the first truck got stuck. Well, the thing to do is take the elephants out of the, their truck and have them pull the equipment in, which tore the field up. You couldn't believe it. Anyway, we got straw all put down, and, and the fir circus got all set up. Uh, we had a couple of nice performances, a lot of people, and we made about $2,500. Well, lo and behold, after the circus moved out, the school district contacted us and said that, you know, you need to have that lot leveled out again, graded, and reseeded. And so we did. That cost about $2,400. Next thing you knew, they had sold it. And then there was a time that they moved up uh, mm -hmm. to the new high school. So it was in the early 60s. That, you didn't that, make much money on that project. Bucks. But that was typical. I mean, we sold flags on Main Street. We sold doormats to people. Uh, we did the project, for example, of going around and uh, painting the uh, numbers on the curb in front mm -hmm. of houses for a couple of bucks a piece, whatever. Mm -hmm. Then um, we had a group, we had at that time probably about um, 75 to 80 members, but 65 of those were very active, and we would get groups and do that. So it taught us a lot about running projects, uh, doing mm -hmm. budgeting. Mm -hmm. managing managing labor, scheduling people, etc. Mm -hmm. It was a great training ground. Now, all the money that was raised was typically channeled toward July 4th and the uh, July 4th fireworks and such. Certainly uh, it was. We ran all the booths for the carnival, mm -hmm. um, and those were ours, and we ran all the games were ours. Mm -hmm. uh, we would raise money from the merchants. We didn't get any money from the city for mm -hmm. fireworks. Um, and uh, but we also uh, would put that money back into buying things for the prizes at uh, the Easter egg mm -hmm. roll, for example. Uh, we did Christmas baskets at Christmas time. The uh, Ames Electric Power Plant was always gracious to let us take food mm -hmm. in there. People brought us canned stuff, but we had to buy all the perishables. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. county gave us the list of names. And we'd all get together and separate it, put it in baskets, and deliver it just prior to Christmas. Mm -hmm. So we reinvested that money uh, in the community. You had mentioned a little bit earlier about the town and gown split, particularly in 1954 to 1958, that, that time period. And it probably lasted a little bit um, longer. How did, how did that play out for you as a business person? Did you get associated at all with the university oh, side of it? Oh, you, you had certain ones that you did, but there was definitively two communities, mm -hmm. uh, the university community, college community in those days, and of course, the downtown. Mm -hmm. Now, the business people out in campus town did associate with the, through the mm -hmm. chamber and that, but there wasn't that nice, tight relationship that we have now and, and cooperative relationship. Um, but you could make your way into mm -hmm. it. And that really started to fade um, probably in the 60s into mm -hmm. the 70s. Dr. Parks did uh, some community stuff that helped bring that together. Mm -hmm. And then um, it was uh, progressed to what it is today. And certainly Dr. Jiski and uh, uh, his wife uh, worked uh, on that. And Jofries have really opened up that communication. Mm -hmm. I hope you'll be willing to tell me the story of how the um, JCs relaxed after they did a carnival because I think this kind of links the um, town people with the university in a way that you might not expect. Are you willing well, to ch share that with sure. me? Sure. Okay. We, um, we had some members that worked out at Iowa State. We had one individual in particular who worked at the Ames Lab. Uh, he is since, uh, to my knowledge, deceased. Mm -hmm. But a um, uh, lot of us would take vacation. And I mean, we would work four or five days on this project because we had all of these booths that we had made in storage and mm -hmm. had to get them out, etc. This individual would um, acquire for us um, a couple of gallon jars of 180, 90 proof alcohol. <laughs> So we always uh, had uh, 
horse tanks to sell pop and things. So we would buy watermelons and before the celebration started, we would inject those with the alcohol and then put them in the bottom of the horse tanks. Then when the celebration was all over, everything was torn down, put away, we'd have a big party and we would eat watermelon. And it was like a uh, cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> and there was no town and gown split at that point, no. No, <laughs> no. in fact, we also had, uh, we would hire a police officer mm -hmm. to uh, watch the grounds at night. And it right. happened to be Bill Good, who lived mm -hmm. on Duff. He had a little travel trailer he'd bring down. But Bill also made some homemade wine in that, and, and he would bring that along. So we had a great relationship and <laughs> had a lot of fun. And nobody, uh, I would say quite honestly, that um, very few occasions would anybody overindulge. So mm -hmm. we never had problems with it. But it was great socializer. Yeah. Pretty refreshing, I'm sure. Yes. Of course, <laughs> I don't know. People may remember the Red Stocking Review that mm -hmm. the JCs put on and JCS. Mm -hmm. We used to uh, hire uh, a firm out of New York City. Um, they would send a director and all the costumes. Mm -hmm. And we would rehearse for probably three or four weeks. Mm -hmm. And we would uh, be in what was the high school auditorium in those mm -hmm. days where City Hall is today. And we would put on a Friday night um, performance and Saturday matinee and Saturday night uh, to raise money. But all of the actors and actresses were in fact members of the JCs or the community. Mm -hmm. And it was a community show and it was a lot of fun. And we did that for a good number of years. One thing I didn't um, bring up that the JCs were very instrumental in, not only in Ames but in Story County, was the salt polio vaccine. Dr. Hildebrand from McFarland Clinic was our associate in that. We were able to purchase uh, the, the vaccine um, and in those days they would put a drop on a sugar cube for mm -hmm. example mm -hmm. uh, and we were responsible we advertised, we went around, we held clinics and immunized all the children free. Wow, I didn't know that. And Can that you project, give me a year of a um, year? Oh gosh. Range? That would have probably been in the, the late 60s, early 70s. Really? Yeah. Hmm, I thought yeah. it might have been earlier than that. Well, it could have been. Mm -hmm. But uh, today, that same project was carried on around the world by Rotary International. Mm -hmm. And so, a disease it, that needs that to get was, eradicated. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, let's come back to Main Street for just a second. Okay. And we're in the late 1950s, early 1960s, kind of our time frame here. And just talk about some of the people in some of those um, businesses um, along Main Street. I'll just give you an open ended, and you could maybe start where you'd like to. Well, let's see. Um, there was, of course, on the south side of Main Street, next to Tom Evans Park, which is Tom Evans Park today, uh, was J.C. Penney's. Uh, there was a manager there by the name of Couser, um, who was pretty prominent within the community. Um, Woolworths had a manager, and I can't recall his name, but he was kind of a fuddy-duddy. And if you went in the store, he would almost follow you around because everything was out on open display cases. Mm -hmm. I assume they had some problems with people picking things up and walking <laughs> out with it. Uh, triplet real estate and mm -hmm. insurance was uh, uh, about mid-block across from McDowell's uh, mm -hmm. in, on Main Street on the south side, Dudley Triplet. Mm -hmm. And of course his son Jim Triplet is mm -hmm. still in the community today. Mm -hmm. And Doug Triplett, what kind of a, because he was, in a sense, a competitor. Yeah. 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 But he was mainly related more to real estate. Real estate. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, Dudley was very strict. Yeah. Uh, just uh, kind of grouchy in some respects. Uh, and some were to the younger people until they got to know him a little mm -hmm. bit. Uh, up the street was Eschbach Music. Mm -hmm. um, that's where Pumpkin Patch is today. Mm -hmm. uh, Art Eschbach was always a gentleman, friendly. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. if, then on the corner uh, next to Eschbach was the Eames uh, building and loan in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, that's now Wells Fargo today because it became, uh, got bought out and moved mm -hmm. to the other end of Main Street. 
at the other end was actually the bus depot. <laughs> but and Wells Fargo, where's Wells Fargo now, was the bus, bus depot. depot. Yeah. And the buses drove in and parked, <laughs> and they had a cafe, and mm -hmm. underneath they had a meeting room. And sometimes mm -hmm. the JCs met in that meeting room. Other community groups did too. Mm -hmm. Directly across the street then was uh, Made Right. That was their new place because they were at the far end of Main Street down by Duff originally. Mm -hmm. um, so then you came across AIM stationers, uh, Jack Hazlett mm -hmm. and Marv Miller, were, mm -hmm. and they were both very active in the community. Um, you had, uh, it started out about where Brown Shoe Fit is, or not Brown, Lazy M, which mm -hmm. is now going out of business, was a five and dime store. Originally started as Krager's, or Krager's. Mm -hmm. uh, Kresge's, that's mm -hmm. it. But that later became PM Place. And then after that, it was purchased by Rudy Van Dree. Uh, Rudy was a state legislator mm -hmm. um, in the House. Um, he also was the founder of Ames Advertiser. Mm -hmm. And uh, he bought that building. And the second floor then, he rented out, and that became the JC's club rooms. Hmm. Um, again, there was a building that um, the floor upstairs was pretty wavy, and we would a couple times a year have a complete cleaning of the club rooms, which meant mopping and water and suds and soap. Well, if we weren't careful, that would leak through the floor, and where it would <laughs> end up was in the women's bras. <laughs> And we bought numerous bras or replaced <laughs> bras for Rudy, even though he was even a member, but trying to help him out. So, And then you went a little farther, you had um, um, where there's that little tiny building that used to be Bates Insurance. Mm -hmm. um, that actually was Claire Wilson Real Estate. Hmm. Claire Wilson was one of the gentlemen of the community, always dressed to the nines. Um, the proper hat, the jacket, mm -hmm. um, saddle shoes or black and white shoes, white pants if it was summer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he was just the dapper image mm -hmm. uh, and uh, a very fine gentleman. Mm -hmm. uh, then you went, there was another clothing store, men's clothing store was Ryerson's. Mm -hmm. um, and Ryerson also uh, did um, sign painting. And if you remember back in those days, particularly the banks, insurance agencies, had these signs that were gold leaf with the black edge. And he would do those. Uh, so he probably painted all of them that were on Main Street or in lawyers' offices at that time. There probably are lots of pictures of his work, all yes. the advertisements <laughs> sure. that, of them. Yep. Yeah. Uh, then you went down and of course where um, uh, Duff uh, Little Park walkthrough is, there was an appliance store there, mm -hmm. Bush Appliance originally. Um, and then it just trickled off. There were some restaurants uh, mm -hmm. on past. Of course, right. the north side at the east end, other than Main Right, was um, the bars, sportsmen still there. Uh, but there was Tom's Grill, and that's where um, Great Plains mm -hmm. Sauce and Dough mm -hmm. is. That was Tom's Grill. Um, Tom was very, uh, uh, very active in the community. Mm -hmm. um, next to him, to the east where the billiard place is today, was actually Bleecker Furniture, mm -hmm. Hiram Bleecker. Mm -hmm. um, he uh, was uh, involved in the community, but he mm -hmm. was pretty strict. Mm -hmm. He had a son who was killed uh, in the service, was a mm -hmm. Marine. Um, then you came down, of course, was the gas company on the corner. Mm -hmm. uh, above that was actually the beginnings of Pyle Accounting. It was uh, Pyle and Yulestead. Hmm. Um, and also the Hagelin Law Office was up there. Yeah. And across the street was the Union Story Bank. And then you got into Tilden's, mm -hmm. uh, Jameson's Men's Clothing, which had a store out in Campus Town. Mm -hmm. uh, a little farther down was uh, Ober's, mm -hmm. uh, which became Bledsoe's. And there was Burke's down there also. Max Burke had a men's clothing store. It's amazing store. that so many clothing stores, you know, could make it out of Main right. Street. You mentioned you, the Union Story Bank. Um, now, 
Alden Harrison was involved with Alden you? Harrison, right. yes. And I think that Alden Harrison helped um, a young woman who had an interesting um, job down in Cambridge. Yes. <laughs> uh, it was after Union Story moved from the corner of Douglas and Maine down to where U.S. Bank is today. That was mm -hmm. the, the Union Story. It was a very modern building with the scallops and everything. Mm -hmm. Um, Alden handled a lot of business for people, cultivated businesses. He and I became friends, um, and the young lady was Linda Jubeck, and she was known because she was the outstanding go-go girl. Cambridge at that time had a bar, and I just don't remember the name of it. I think it's still in operation, but people came from all around to see Linda. She was very attractive. She was a college graduate. And uh, she had things that needed to be insured, and Alden sent her to me. And uh, so I took care of her. My <laughs> office crew always said, hmm, you know. <laughs> but no, but she was uh, and very proper. Mm -hmm. But uh, And then I just sent all the bills to Alden, and he would pay them. You know, <laughs> so. And she later uh, married um, a mason uh, who was a, a bricklayer mason. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they moved to Pennsylvania, and after she had been gone through four years, I did tell her, I thought since she was going to stay out there, she ought to make some local contact. Mm -hmm. But, yep, there, <laughs> yeah, had a lot of interesting customers over the years. <laughs> um, and uh, we, I guess we're talking about bankers, and he was, he was quite a uh, pillar um, there on Main Street for a while, Mr. Bob Stafford. Yes. And did you have some workings with him? Oh, yes. The First National Bank was located directly across from the old city hall on Kellogg, right mm -hmm. at the corner of Bibb. Um, Joni and I had purchased a home up on Melrose, 207 Melrose, it's still there. Mm -hmm. But it was one of the little cracker box houses, an H&F house, um, and it didn't have a garage. Mm -hmm. And I, we did do business, I, I'd always done business at First National Bank, and of course everybody said, Bob Stafford was always so tough and a real strict banker. And so after we bought it, I walked in one day and, and uh, he sat toward the front on the left side, as I recall. And so I said, Bob, could I borrow $500 to build a garage? And so he looked up and he said, sure. And Gabe <laughs> said, I'll put $500 in your account. And I said, okay, what am I gonna pay back when or whatever? He said whenever you can pay me back and you'll pay the interest. And uh, I paid him back at the end of the year. And, uh, but he was very simple to do business with. I really felt great. <laughs> well, don't you think that that was a, a philosophy that might have been more prevalent at the time? There weren't so many forms. There weren't so many regulations. You could do business on a handshake. Oh, absolutely, yes. And of course, I knew his father Mm -hmm. Clay Stafford mm -hmm. and Roger Alley, who later became a president, also mm -hmm. of First National. So I knew practically everybody in the bank. I did in most of the banks also, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, it was great to have that business relationship. Across from the the uh, north, across from First National, was a cafe called the Rainbow Cafe. Mm -hmm. uh, at the back of the Rainbow Cafe was the chamber office. It was a little narrow office and it had a little kind of a co excuse me, conference room. Um, and in fact, Bob Mickle, who's still in the community and alive, was the manager. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a group called the Coffee Clatch, which were a lot of the prominent business people, uh, people from the city council, mm -hmm. um, particularly like the Adams. I know Bill Vogt was involved in that. Um, some of the lawyers in town, um, Hirschberger, Smeedall, mm -hmm. uh, all of those people, and they would meet and have coffee. And their, their motto was something, and I think the chamber office today may still have this saying, but you um, keep your eye upon the donut and not upon the hole or something <laughs> like that. And uh, they would meet and things would get done. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, that um, is kind of in keeping with the idea that decision making was made on different kinds of levels than it's made now, or in different ways, I and guess. And there were fewer committees. 
I mean, there would be a group and they would say, okay, let's do this. One of the things I remember that I worked with Bill Vogt with, uh, that a group decided uh, the Iowa Boys Athletic Association uh, was going to make their rules film for basketball at Ames High, mm -hmm. the old, what is now City Hall today mm -hmm. in that gymnasium. So that group uh, and Bill, I guess volunteers got appointed had to raise $500 to get the floor refinished and repainted with the big A and everything that's there now. Mm -hmm. And so I went out with him and we collected $5 here and $5 there and it got done and the floor got refinished and the film was made and it's probably in the archives of the Athletic Association <laughs> to this day. Via that group that met at the little chamber office there. That was probably more than just that. I'm sure there were lots of other little stories that came out of that as oh, well. Oh, I'm, I'm sure there were. That may not have been privy to them at that time. Uh -huh. Of course, during 64, 65, the year I was president, we had the centennial celebration in Ames. That mm -hmm. was a big project. Uh, that involved the entire community. And in fact, at that time, I was president of the JCs and Pat Heaton uh, was president of the chamber. Mm -hmm. uh, there was heat and floor covering on Main Street, uh, just about where um, the, let's see, would be about where the travel office is across from U.S. Bank, uh, where Linda Glance was in that area, mm -hmm. that was that building, he had mm -hmm. the floor covering. Uh, there was a contest um, for which one could uh, grow the best beard and the idea was that the morning of the Centennial Parade, uh, there would be a public half shaving of the person who lost. So uh, you would put a penny in a jar and that per pennies would be one vote. So if you put a nickel, there were five votes. Anyway, I was fortunate to win. I had an Abe Lincoln, and I wore an Abe Lincoln hat and a vest. And, but uh, so we sat there and Pat uh, got half of his shaved off and. We rode in the parade then. Um, I was, I think there's still a picture around. I was actually in a bathtub on a cart, if people will remember at the train station, there used to be these big wheeled carts that mm -hmm. they would put luggage on or mail bags. Mm -hmm. It was on one of those and some guys pulling it. And I had a pump fire extinguisher and I would squirt people. But um, <laughs> it was shortly after that. Uh, I think later that fall, or maybe just after the first year, Pat had a heart attack and passed mm -hmm. away. But uh, mm -hmm. we had a lot of fun with uh, Mayor Pearl DeHart was mayor then. He had mm -hmm. an accounting business on Main Street. On the south side just would be a few doors um, east of uh, Kellogg mm -hmm. upstairs. Uh, he and Bernice ran that, but he was mayor for many years and uh, they were very involved in this whole thing, as were all the business people. It was great fun. Um, what, one other little question about the kinds of businesses that were on Main Street. Um, how was it that so many men's clothiers could prosper, do you think? Well, of course, the dress code was much different <laughs> then. Wore a tie every day, you know, mm -hmm. a shirt, a jacket, mm -hmm. um, suits were mm -hmm. in, you know, and so. Uh, there was much more opportunity to sell, mm -hmm. uh, not the casual that you have today. Mm -hmm. um, even to the point that we worked on Saturdays, at mm -hmm. least uh, till one or two o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, then, uh, then later we would, and I remember at McDowell's, we would draw straws and alternate when Iowa State was playing football at home who had to stay and work in the office and couldn't mm -hmm. go to the game. And mm -hmm. then finally, we moved to closing at noon. <laughs> and then, of course, it evolved to closing on Saturday and now yeah. we close early Friday afternoon. <laughs> it's completely it's different. different. But it was okay. much more formal. Right. Uh, and there were more formal gatherings. Mm -hmm. um, the JCs used to sponsor an annual awards banquet. Uh, mm -hmm. And we would, we would give awards to the outstanding young man, which mm -hmm. was between 21 and 35. And there was a national program by the National JCs for that mm -hmm. also. 
but we would give the outstanding educator, the mm-hmm. outstanding farmer, the outstanding business person, those kinds of things, and we would put that on. But you didn't go to those things unless you were dressed up, mm-hmm. and that meant mm-hmm. a suit or a tie mm-hmm. for the men, mm-hmm. uh, of course, dress for the women uh, kind of thing. And so there were more of those kind of activities around. All the banquets that were held uh, were more formalized than, than mm-hmm. they are today. And uh, there were so many cafes, too. When I think about it, how many little cafes were in probably a seven, eight block area on Main Street and then on the, the north and, and, and whatnot. There were just right. lots of little cafes now, around. Most of those, with the exception uh, of the, the hotel cafe, uh, there were more people would eat there, uh, on, say Sunday and that, and dress up and go to. Mm-hmm. Most of them were more casual, but you would see the business people with their jackets and their mm-hmm. ties sitting at counters or little mm-hmm. booths, etc. Yeah, mm-hmm. and there was Frangos up on Main Street, mm-hmm. the Frango family. Yeah, so. Well, um, today Pappy I. Pappy Dolis. You remember <laughs> Pappy Dolis? Tell who, me about that. Well. Um, I don't know for sure, but the Frangos, is my understanding, adopted these two young men. And they were challenged, uh, had some mental challenges. Pappy Donalus would walk up and down Main Street and whistle. And you could hear him when he took off from Frangos. If you were down where Hy-Vee Drug Drugstore is today, you could hear him whistle. He had this rule, and he would walk. But sometimes he'd wear his cap pistols. And he, I know, several times was accused of coming up to people and say, stick them up, and some lady dropped her groceries or something. <laughs> um, his brother uh, was a little more um, uh, introvert, didn't, mm-hmm. but, but they worked very hard in the restaurant. Mm-hmm. Frango's was a good restaurant also, yeah. Well, today I had wanted to talk to you about Main Street and the JCs. Um, is there anything else in that kind of umbrella you'd like to tell me about that just a thought that comes to you? No, it was um, it was fun. Um, people were very friendly. Everybody um, said hi or stopped and, and talked. Um, I think sometimes with all the technology we have today we get kind of isolated. Um, I always try to say hi to people and, mm-hmm. uh, and smile. Mm-hmm. Some of them walk down the street looking at their phones today and they <laughs> uh-huh. don't know but but we had a lot of variety downtown and it was the place to be. Well thank you for uh, letting me be in your home today and we'll have another conversation about some other things another time because you have <laughs> lots of uh, influence on the community but Ted thank you so much. Well thank you very much. Joni and I dearly love it.